Goedenavond, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. If I may have your attention for, um, actually for quite a while, this is about two hours, this program. Um, very warm welcome to you all. Um, it's great to have you uh, tonight. Um, my name is Juri Albrecht, I'm the director of the Bali and I will try to um, uh, moderate this evening, which I'm very happy to do, um, it's a great honor. Um, we're talking about um, uh, uh, Russia, the Kremlin, and uh, a deal it's called dealing with Russia, but what we of course will be doing is talking about NATO, talking about the EU, talking about America, uh, Russia, and uh, geopolitics. And um, we have been organizing evenings like this for many, many years, um, especially about Eastern Europe. Um, we have been uh, programming uh, and inviting people like um, Veronica Munk, the chief editor of the last independent uh, media outlet in Budapest. We have uh, asked uh, to sp speak here Ukrainian writer Andrei Kurkov. We've asked Andrei Sanikov, the uh, candidate from Belarus, the, the presidential candidate from Belarus, who has been tortured and talked about that. We have recently uh, invited Svetlana Tikhanovskaya to talk to her. We have talked to Zana Nemtsova about the murder of her father, Boris. Um, we've had Pusey Riot here, um, So, but recently this became a major international war crisis and suddenly um, uh, there's a lot of attention for it because I have to say uh, even uh, when Andrei Sanikov or uh, the Belarus Free Theater talked about their tortures and there, there wasn't much interest but now one of the maybe tiny 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 silver linings of the international crisis is that suddenly we realize that Europe is not only the part which is on the North Sea or on the Atlantic but that's a big continent to the east as well um, and tonight we're very, very happy to, uh, be, uh, uh, to be able to listen to Robert Kaplan, Robert D. Kaplan, geopolitical analyst, best-selling author of more than 20 books on foreign affairs and travel, and travel um, translated into many, many languages. A few of his, book, of his books, um, the, the most recent one, Adriatic, a wonderful book, um, The Good American, The Revenge of Geography, um, my personal favorite, I would say, Mediterranean Winter, but also a wonderful, wonderful book, Monsoon, The Indian Ocean and the Future of American Power. I mean, really the whole globe. Amazing, amazing uh, body of work. And um, not only that, uh, he holds the Robert Strauss Huppé Chair of Geopolitics at Foreign Policy Institute. Um, he's writing for three decades at least for the Atlantic. Um, he was a member of the Pentagon Defense Policy Board and of the U.S. Navy Executive Panel and Foreign Policy, the famous magazine Foreign Policy, uh, um, named him uh, one of the world's top 100 global thinkers. Robert D. Kaplan, uh, give him a warm round of applause. Very, very, very happy to have you here. He's going to introduce. <laughs> Thank you so much, all of you. It's a pleasure to be back here at the Bale, where I haven't been for a few years, but I've been coming back and forth here, not over the years, but over the decades. And we've all seen the world change. I think the first time I was here was in January 1997. So uh, when, uh, when email was just starting up, there were no smartphones. Uh, you know, the internet was still in its infancy, and, um, and that's part of the story that I'll get to uh, in a little bit. Um, the way globalization has changed our world and is connected to the geopolitical events we see today. Um, there was a great American historian of about 120 years ago, who you will all know, Henry Adams, the great-grandson of John Adams, the second U.S. president, and more importantly, the first American ambassador to the Netherlands. Um, and uh, Henry Adams, you know, was also the, he was John Adams' great-grandson and John Quincy Adams, our sixth president, his grandson. And Henry Adams said something, he wrote something before his death in 1907. He said that Russia was, is, and always will be the core problem of Europe. It will always be the greatest European challenge because Russia is too vast to be incorporated into Europe 
and not European enough to fit in with all the, the better institutionalized states of Europe. And he said the ultimate goal of history was to somehow be able to embrace Russia into what Adams called, in what is today quaint language, the Atlantic Combine. Um, and that's, that's what happened. Nothing has changed. Um, seven years after Adams wrote that and died, we had World War I. And the first great battle of World War I was the Battle of Tannenberg um, in what is today Poland um, between the, the German army and the Russian army. And it was the disastrous Russian performance at the Battle of Tannenberg that led through a chain of events to the Russian Revolution, uh, which of course changed not only Russia, but changed the world and changed the 20th century. In the Second World War, the most murderous of the battlefields were the Eastern, was the Eastern Front between Germany and again Russia. And Russia's Red Army eventually pushed the Germans all the way back to Central Europe, and thus we had a divided Europe and a Cold War for 44 years. Um, all because, as Adam pointed, Adams pointed out, because of Russia. And, but then Russia sort of left the stage for a while. Throughout the 1990s, between, say, 1989 and 2001 or so, Russia was very enfeebled because of the way that the Soviet Union collapsed. And this enfeeblement had geopolitical effects. Um, it meant that when the, the American-led NATO alliance uh, led, uh, had an intervention in Bosnia in 1995 and in Kosovo in 1999, uh, there was very little relative pushback from Russia because Russia was too weak. This was an historical anomaly because normally, historically, the Balkans were an area of the sphere of influence of Russia, and Russia exerted a significant geo uh, political influence in places like Serbia and Bulgaria. Um, the, had Russia not been as enfeebled as it was in the 1990s, the Balkan interventions would have probably happened in a different way than they did. And then we had what I call, in American English, the 9-11 head fake. Um, think about it. Um, Russia was enfeebled. Putin had just come into power a year or two before and was starting to rebuild the Russian state. The Chinese Navy was still over the horizon. Nobody in Washington, was, except for a few experts, was really focusing on, uh, on China's naval growth and particularly its, its air force and, and, you know, and, mili and military growth in general. So it seemed as if there were no threats on the horizon. 9-11 happened in that context. Um, so that the head fake was this assumption that the great strategic threat was Islamic terrorism. You know, not, China, not Russia, not China. And, but then, as Putin rebuilt Russia along his own way, and the Chinese Navy became obvious to everyone by 2005 and 2006, it was clear that America had wasted years focused on, uh, on Iraq, on Afghanistan, and suddenly it was in a great power competition with Russia and, with Russia and China. And, um, and just to put the two together, uh, let me talk for a minute or two about China, because right here, right tonight, we're going to be focused on Russia. But a few years from now, we may be focused on Taiwan, uh, very, you know, very much so. And uh, um, I can say now that the that the Cold War, or whatever you want to call it, between the United States and China will be a permanent feature of international relations for the next decade or two. Why am I so sure I could say that? Because of a number of factors, military, cyber, ideology, trade, etc. In the military sphere, 
the Chinese Navy sees the South and East China Seas as the blue water extension of their continental landmass. They see the South and East China Seas almost exactly the way the United States saw the Caribbean Sea in the late 19th century and the early 20th century. Um, yet the American Navy and Air Force see the South and East China Seas as their home waters because they consider America an Asian power. Going back to the mid-19th century, uh, continue, you know, it, America opened up the Philippines. It fought a war of ma a number of years in the Philippines. Uh, there was World War II in the Pacific. There was Vietnam. There was Korea. There was the alliance with Japan after World War II. America is an Asian power. So therefore, the US and China are at odds militarily. Then there's cyber, which is a destabilizing element in the US-China relationship, because both sides have been engaged in a cyber war against each other for several years now. And it actually has been reported in the New York Times and other newspapers. It's just that nobody focuses on it. The general public doesn't focus on it. Um, then there is, uh, there is ideology. For 35 years, China had an enlightened, collegial, risk-averse uh, authoritarian regime uh, under Deng Xiaoping, Jiang Zemin, and Hu Jintao. Uh, this was a regime with mandatory retirement ages, uh, which, we, you know, which, which brought the country into pseudo-capitalism, and American journalists respected it. Uh, China had friends in Congress. It had friends in the top echelons of the US media. That China has disappeared. That China is gone. Uh, we're back to a hard-edged, authoritarian, Mao-trending China uh, under Xi Jinping, where China has, as I said, no friends left in Washington. So this, this is the crisis that awaits us over, over the horizon. Um, and, um, but but back, to, uh, back to Russia for a minute. Uh, it's interesting. For 20 years, Westerners have had the assumption that Vladimir Putin has rebuilt both the quantity and quality of the Russian military. Now, there was a Russian, you know, Russia initiated small wars which changed into frozen conflicts in South Ossetia, in Transdenistria. Um, it, in, it engaged in an air war with a limited number of ground troops in Syria, and, and it used the kind of semi-mercenary Wagner group in sub-Saharan Africa and parts of the Middle East. And all of these deployments more or less went well, and they went well for a reason. He, uh, we were dealing with either an air force or special operations troops that had, that had a reasonable level of professionalism and high morale. Once, however, the general military got involved in what I'll call a war of scale, um, things started to fall apart. Fall apart. It turned out, um, let me s say this. Um, what makes a Western military, whether the Dutch or the Americans or the Australian military, what it is, has to do with non-commissioned officers, uh, NCOs, sergeants, corporals, privates, and, in, and very much empowered lower level officers, lieutenants, and captains. And Western militaries are comfortable decentralizing decision making down to the lower ranks. So the generals can be far back in the rear and only make decisions on big basic things. Uh, one of the reasons why the Russians have lost so many generals in this conflict is that they're not in the rear, they're far forward, because Russia has a weak to non-existent non-commissioned officer corps. And, um, and this has really affected the performance of the Russian army um, and why it has performed so badly, is, is a matter of fact. Um, now we're in a situation where um, 
the, the, the army is great. The Russian army is groping for uh, some successes in the east and the southeast, establishing a land bridge uh, over the south uh, um, by the Black Sea. And we'll see where all this develops. Uh, now, remember what I said at the beginning. When I first came to the Bale, uh, the internet, cell phones, uh, e uh, email were all in their infancy. That was the first stage of globalization. The first stage of globalization, what I call globalization 1.0, was essentially a good news story. It was about the spread of democracy, the enlargement or creation of middle classes in the developing world. It was about technology. Um, it was about a lot. It was about a lot, free trade. It was a good news story, and we we fooled ourselves. We thought this is globalization, but then came globalization 2.0, which is about the re return of autocracy. It, it's about middle class angst. Um, it's about populism. It's about. Um, it's about using technology to monitor the behavior of your people, like what's happening in China, where they're following the internet searches of dozens of millions of people to determine if they're good citizens or not. Uh, the dark side of technology somewhat. And that's where we are now. We're in, and oh, by the way, without free trade. Free trade has go gone by the wayside too. Um, so that's, wh that's where we are now. We fa we're in a, a, a great power conflict where Europe is in the middle during gl globalization 2.0. And just finally, before I leave the stage, let me say, when I think of this world today, I see it as an incredibly claustrophobic world uh, where technology has defeated distance. And the enemy is not 500 miles away in military terms. It's one click away. And so uh, and where a crisis can migrate from one part of the earth to the other much quicker than in the past. So inter, you know, interconnectivity um, is seen as a, a, a positive in financial markets. But in geopolitical terms, it can be a negative because it could mean the spread of crisis from one part of the earth to the other. And that's why we have to be very vigilant uh, in the crisis we're in now and the crises we will have because they can easily spread. Uh, a short, sharp war in the, in the South China Sea, for instance, lasting just a few days, can easily spread to missiles being fired into the heart of China and elsewhere, um, and, and, to, and to general cyber war. So it's a, it's a difficult world environment now precisely because of the way that technology and its development have interacted with military events. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your um, introduction, for your quite worrying introduction, I would say. Um, not very um, reassuring. <laughs> but um, anyhow, that's, uh, you're not here to reassure us. You're, you're uh, here for many different other reasons. Um, thank you for your overview of the global situation. Um, let's, we come back to that, but let's tune a little bit back to uh, the war in Ukraine and the Russians, and then we get back to the, the bigger picture, I'm sure, later on. We have two more um, uh, speakers on this panel uh, later on. But um, um, if I might start, um, were, you, um, were you surprised that um, suddenly a real old-fashioned war was upon us in February? It, you know, it becomes a problem of imagination. Intellectually, you can predict something like mm -hmm. this, but your imagination is limited. And I notice that some of the mistakes I've made in the past have been because I couldn't imagine it, even though intellectually I knew it was possible. I never imagined somebody like Donald Trump as president. 
No. He was just too weird, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I said, no, someone like that could never be in the no. White House. That's not the story of history as it evolves. Well, it, it could. So I would say that um, I'm not... Uh, I'm not totally surprised by Russia's invasion of Ukraine, but I could never imagine it. And I think that is at the heart of why Europe and the U.S. have reacted as they have with such a dramatic overpouring of support. Um, because something happened that challenged their imagination. Mm -hmm. They couldn't imagine it, and suddenly, because of it, World War II, which is, I think, eight decades in the past, almost eight decades sure. in the past, now seems a lot closer. Yeah. It seems a lot closer than it did four months ago. Um, it seemed closer than in the end of the Cold War in the 1990s. Uh, um, uh, when I was first here in the 1990s, the World War II was like ancient history. Um, but now, it, now suddenly, it, in 2022, it's not. So the issue is one of imagination, I think. So in that sense, I was not prepared for it. Now, um, it's very wonderfully put. Um, it has to do with imagination, and suddenly it, it really materializes in front of your eyes, and you mm. think, yes, of course, mm. no, this, this could have, this, this is happening. Um, do you think uh, we? we made a mistake, we, the West, we, the Americans and the Europeans, so call it like that, to not take Russia seriously over the past decades. And you, you, you described this sort of feeble Russia between 1989, the fall of the, uh, the, the, the Berlin Wall and the Iron Curtain and 2001, you said. I'm an arbitrary uh, number. Yeah, a little bit like yeah, that. But, right. And, 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 and it's, it's wonderful how you described, yes, um, and there was no Russian reaction on our actions on the Balkan, huh? because they weren't there, because they weren't prepared to defend their interests. Um, but would you say that really from 1989 onwards, or at least maybe the last 10, 15, 20 years, we have been, we have been not taking the Russians seriously enough? Uh, I would put it this way. The West did a number of things which, it, well, let me start this way. Vladimir Putin is not Adolf Hitler in the sense that Hitler published the 1922 Mein Kampf, yeah. where he said, I'm gonna do this, this, and yeah. this. I read the book and it's, yeah. it's literally all in it. Yeah, and then he got into power. He was very one-dimensional. Mm -hmm. He didn't evolve, so to speak. He sprung up as a finished person in the early 1920s, the end of World War I. Mm -hmm. And then he just rose to power. Putin evolved, which is why I think people made a mistake about him, why the German establishment made a mistake about him, others. You know, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't just a flat horizontal line from, from, you know, from the end of the Cold War to the invasion of Ukraine. Things happened. Um, uh, the United States and NATO expanded to the east. Um, and it expanded into the former Warsaw Pact countries. But it also expanded into part of the former Soviet Union, the Baltic states. Of course, they're problematic as they only became part of the Soviet Union, I think it was in 1940 or something like that. It was part yeah. of the Ribbentrop Molotov right. Pact. Yeah. Yeah. Where they're, but they're at least since, that over. At yeah. least since yeah. 1940 or so, or 40, you know, in that period, it became part of the so. Soviet Union, so that affected him. That affected his thinking. And then there was, um, you know, genuine expressions for democracy in a number of former Soviet republics that the West supported. And he became paranoid about this. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, and so I think there was a kind of an evolution in a, in, you know, in in some way, it wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't all just a straight line that he had that he had this planned all along, you know. All, all, although, if if he did, I think one of the reasons why he invaded was he saw Ukraine could become a Western, a stable Western democracy. It could evolve. Yeah. You know? You know, it wasn't there yet. There was high level of corruption and institutional weakness, you know. But you know, there was a trajectory. It was going places, in yeah. other words. So I think events intruded. You know, obviously events always do, and they form most people. 
Events, my dear boy, events. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Harold Macmillan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, what politicians have to deal with. Yeah. Um, well, um, Otto von Habsburg said, you know, that he was the nastiest KGB agent he'd ever came across, and he was a real, real uh, uh, a bad person, <laughs> and he he advocated that for a long time. So, I mean, he, you're right. I mean, he did evolve, of course, but he was. I mean, yeah. uh, whether Otto he, von Habsburg said this about Putin. Yeah. So he, he knew him. When yeah, he, he knew was him. A KGB yeah. agent. Yeah. Interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, and um, yeah. Uh, so I mean, but that doesn't make him Hitler, of course. <laughs> but yeah. but yeah. Um, um, but. Um, um, y yeah, but um, this this whole idea that um, uh, we've sort of cornered him, um, uh, which you hear a lot, you know, that we provoked him into uh, into this sort of uh, uh, defensive reaction. Uh, would you call that the right way of looking at it, or is that...? No, I don't agree with that. I mean, he had a lot of other options. There, mm -hmm. In fact, um, there were many members of the Russian establishment, you know, who were sort of in Putin's circle, who were genuinely surprised by the invasion. I mean, because everyone assumed he... Because look at it this way. The day before the invasion, his position was very strong. He had 100,000, was it, troops around Ukraine. He, he could brag about handling Syria. Uh, he, could, he could brag about other things that he had done. You know, the, 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 Wagner, the Wagner Group, et cetera. Um, uh, you know, the R Russian military expert, Michael Kaufman, said that Putin learned um, something in Syria which was different than what George W. Bush learned in, in, in Iraq. George W. Bush learned that war is unpredictable and very costly and could destroy you. Putin learned in Syria that you could do war on the cheap. You know, you can go in on the, only in the air or mainly in the air and not get bogged down on the ground. And you, know, you, could, you, a, a, and you could get out anytime you wanted, essentially. Um, so I think um, he, you know, he had not known failure, really. He had not known military failure. He kept pushing and pushing and pushing. And this turned out to be a bridge too far. This, this, this invasion of Ukraine. Yeah, yeah. And, and it was a bridge too far because this was an invasion, an action of scale, which required a regular army with what's called combined arms, coordinating air force, naval, and land movements meticulously. Yeah. And it was also about logistics, logistics, logistics. Getting food, foods, f food, fuel, ammunition, spare parts up to the frontline units in an expeditious manner. And the, the Russian military could not handle that. Obviously, no. Um, even their flagship was sunk, um, uh, for for instance, and that sort of things. But so the, the coordination of that um, was like I think the greatest uh, naval action since the British sunk the Belgrano in the Falkland War of 1982. I can't think of another one, you know, that was that dramatic. Yeah, the sinking of the Bismarck, maybe. But well, that was before. <laughs> that was before, yeah. yeah. But since yeah. 1982, <laughs> since the Falkland War. Yeah. Um, um, but if I'm right, if I'm listening to you, you're saying that Putin learned a different thing than W. w. Bush um, learned from waging war. Um, and you're right. I mean, he, he did the same in Chechnya. He did the same in Georgia. He, um, so to put the f first question, not the other question, to put it the other way around, uh, didn't we, um, we, didn't, we were obviously way too lenient towards uh, a, a guy which used force all the time and was never told off. So he, he, he took South Os uh, uh, Ossetia, he took Abkhazia, uh, he did horrible things in Syria, and nobody, nobody put anything in his way. So we should have. Obviously. Yeah? I mean, uh, you know, because, um, and it, you know, it wasn't just the Americans, it was the Europeans as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's, because, <laughs> that's a good thing you bring it in. Yeah. yeah mm -hmm. um, and, and it was especially the German establishment. Uh, you know, not just Gerhard Schroeder, who's famous for this, but Angela Merkel. Um, 
And, uh, I, but I think it was because these were all individual things, you know, that you could, that didn't test your imagination overly. You know, if you were a Western newspaper reader, mm -hmm. um, is, um, essentially. And then, um, and, and so he was vastly underestimated because nobody believed he would actually do this. Yeah. And, you know, and it was common. I mean, when Mitt Romney said that Vladimir Putin is our greatest threat in 2012, Obama laughed at him. Yeah. Um, when, uh, um, when um, uh, Joe Biden became president, he said, we're going to park Russia. You know, which is, you know, slang for saying we're going to de-emphasize Russia because it's not our main threat. We're going to focus on China. And I can tell you the Pentagon for the last decade and a half, two decades, is a building devoted to confronting China. You know, it's all about China because that's where the money is. That's where the procurement money is because it's high-tech warfare. They call China the pacing power. You know, because uh, pacing means simply by competing with it, by pacing along with it, we're getting to be a better military ourselves. And we're getting more budget. And we're getting our... more budget, and, it's, and, and China is more cyber-oriented, more digital, more high-end. It's naval warfare, and navies are frightfully expensive. Four billion dollars for every attack submarine, 18 billion with the, sh with the planes on board for every aircraft carrier. You're talking about a lot of money here, whereas land warfare is much cheaper essentially. So the Pentagon was focused on China. Gosh. No, it's it's a, a way of having their way with the next budget, of course. Also. That's, that's part of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, navies, and Paul Kennedy, the great historian, just published a book two weeks ago that I reviewed for the Washington Post about how naval power is the auditor of national greatness or weakness, because it just costs so much money that you've got to have a big budget to be a, and a tax base in order to pay for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, um, but um, in that respect, um, if you're right, I mean, if indeed we, we, we should have told Putin off and paid more attention to him and, and told him off after he used so many times violent, violent violence effectively, um, that, so now we really now he's threatening with nuclear arms. At least you know he's hinting at it. At least he's hinting at yeah. it. even more. You would. so um, how to deal with Russia? Telling him off, uh, bullying him down, shouting, or or, or 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 trying again not to upset him. Uh, with the nuclear issue, it's good to learn the lesson of what I said earlier: the imagination. Mm -hmm. Simply because we can't imagine it because nobody has seen it since Hiroshima and Nagasaki, doesn't mean it cannot happen, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's good, you know, we, we, should, we should take this very, very seriously. There's a military issue with, with a tactical nuclear. First of all, Russia has a different doctrine for using nuclear weapons than, than the United States and England and France do. Mm -hmm. um, that doc in, in the West, a nuclear weapon is something different from normal warfare. Um, but in Russian military doctrine, it's a natural organic extension of the conventional battlefield. And, you ha and Russia, I believe, has many more small-scale tactical nuclear weapons than the, than the Americans have. So it's a very usable thing from, from Russian military doctrine. Um, scary thought. It's scary. I think um, the Biden administration has been so impressive in terms of organizing this response, this war, uh, you, you know, at all levels, sanctions, defending against cyber attacks, bringing NATO together, um, uh, you know, the whole military side, the Pentagon had it switch on its other foot from China to Russia very quickly on this. I'm sure they're thinking through options about what if, you know, what if he actually did this. But... Um Looking at it from the as an historian or 
somebody who writes on geopolitics, on a high-level analysis, you would have to really make clear that he can't do that and he can't get away with that. Is that what you're... Yeah, absolutely. And that yeah. may have actually been taking place. We just don't know about it or read about it. How yeah. would you imagine uh, you that it could First of all, the U.S. has, 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 has um, a communication line to the Russians. It's not like they're not talking to each other 100%. No, they actually, the chief of staff phoned each other the other, yeah. the last week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and I'm sure the conversation might have gone something like, if you just be aware, if you do this, we can do this, this, and the other. Uh, you, know, make, you know, make a wish list of, you yeah. know, things you can respond with, destroy their Black Sea fleet, blockading their ports. All right, you could say the, that would widen the war. That's exactly what we want to avoid. Um, the, uh, the other side of the argument is, but by actually using a small-scale tactical nuclear weapon, there's really no more limit anyway in that. You know, um, in, you know, he's already broken through a barrier. So, but there are no easy answers to this. You know, I'm groping. I'm not finding an easy answer no, no, in no. terms of a response. <laughs> I appreciate yeah. your uh, thinking out loud with us. Yeah, it's, that, that's it's, all I'm doing is yeah. thinking out loud. And. Um, um, because it looks like there's not much tactical or strategic, let's say tactical maybe, but strategical thinking going on in Moscow because it looks like they're surprised that the Finns and the Swedes are joining NATO. Yeah, that's kind of the ultimate uh, defeat for the Russians. Yeah. Because the whole, one of the great goals of Putin's foreign policy, geopolitics, for years was to divide, divide NATO. Yeah. Uh, was to keep the Scandinavians out, with the exception of the Norwegians, and especially to keep the Germans somewhat divided from the rest of the West. Somewhat more friendly towards. Yeah. yeah. And, and the way you do that is through a pharaonic network of natural gas pipelines, where you get Eastern and Central Europe um, basically eating out of your hand, because they cannot get that quality of gas at that price and that conveniently delivered anywhere else. I mean, there is, you know, there's all this new natural gas discoveries in the Eastern Mediterranean that will eventually come by pipeline up the Adriatic Sea and other places, um, but that takes time. You know, that's not an overnight solution. Yeah, yeah, so um, uh, it seems that they're sort of lost their sort of long-term strategic thinking by invading, massive, massively invading Ukraine. Yeah, I, well, I think he suffered a real strategic defeat because if you bring the, you know, Sweden, and if you look at a map of the Baltic Sea, uh, what do you see? The eastern shore of the Baltic Sea are Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. Um, and the, but the western and northern shores are Finland and Sweden. So by bringing Sweden and Finland into NATO, that automatically bolsters the three Baltic states. It makes it more costly and problematic for Russia to ever launch any kind of attack on the Baltic states, perhaps even to launch a different kinds of cyber attacks than it has in the past, because there could be consequences from Scandinavia that didn't exist before. So then again, you come back, I come back to the, you uh, brought in China, which is amazingly absent in everybody's analysis. You, I mean, you were one of the first I listened to bringing this in. Um, where is, um, there must have been, um, I would think, and I'm wondering what you think, but I would think that Putin probably um, a phone to Chinese before he went in. That's a very interesting problem, Yuri. Very interesting uh, question and issue. Because the Chinese may have told Putin not to use nuclear weapons. That may be a red line for them. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe we don't have to worry about it as much because the Chinese have said, we're with you up until that, you know? There's been a lot of speculation of that, you know, about that. Um, China, uh, you know, China, imports significant quantities of natural gas 
from, from, from Russia due to an agreement and a pipeline completed in 2014 or thereabouts at very advantageous pricing. Because, in fact, when they made the deal in 2014, they took the Russians to the cleaners in terms of pricing. <laughs> um, but now it would be even more so, because the Russians need China more than before. You know, the Chinese have basically eroded significantly Russian influence in parts of Central Asia through their big pockets, their money, you know, yeah. um, all of that. And Putin has lived with it, you know. Putin's obsession has always been European Russia or greater European Russia. And why, you know, and that's natural because Russia may have 11 time zones or rather half the longitudes of the earth. But if you look at a demographic map of Russia and its outlying areas, it's all in the west or, 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 or southwest or, or south. But um, in the end, for Xi Jinping, who um, indeed you know, has become also also a dictator because there's no end to his term anymore. Yeah. Um, uh, for him, it's a win-win situation because either Russia comes out depleted and and feeble, and so he can have his way with um, uh, Siberia and maybe Taiwan, like, or. Um, uh, Russia wins and the European Union and America would have suffered in the eyes of the global south and the Indians would you know, team up with, not no longer with us. But, so for him, it's an ideal scenario. In, in some ways, keep in, another thing, keep in mind that the longer the Americans are obsessed and preoccupied with Russia, the better for China. And developing islands, runways, um, governance in the South and East China Sea. Because remember, it was George W. Bush's obsession with a war that had gone badly in Iraq that allowed the Chinese military establishment to grow to the level that, that it did because it wasn't getting presidential level attention in Washington um, during those years. And um, so that's, uh, that's another uh, Thing, uh, thing for Russia, but the key for, for China, but the key thing about China is the Chinese are great students of, of warfare. And they studied minutely the, um, the American NATO interventions in the Balkans in the 1990s. They studied minutely the two Gulf Wars of 1990 and 2000, of 1991 and 2003. Uh, and you can be sure they're studying every aspect of this Ukraine crisis, not just the military, but the whole uh, NATO coming together, the sanctions regime, and the Chinese will, will integrate this with their plans for Taiwan. You know, you know, and they may ask themselves from some very serious questions, such as, um, is there another way to do Taiwan? We don't, you know, um, you know, we don't want to get the whole outside, the whole West ganged up on us. On the other hand, we're not as vulnerable as the Russians because not only are we much more integrated into the world economy, we are the world economy, or the world's engine for growth in a way that. Russia under Putin is not even close being. So China has advantages that Russia does not, but still the Chinese will pause and think, are there other ways to, to eventually incorporate Taiwan? And we don't know the answer to that, you know? And she doesn't know the answer to that yet, but you know, they will report to him over time and there will be some serious meetings. We'll pause. But the end goal, you say, is already, I mean, they, and they, they want to have Taiwan. They, they, they may not pause, or they might. Um, but one of the reasons why they may not is because there are different ways to get at Taiwan. You know, Taiwan's biggest trading partner is, is mainland China. Mainland China has more missiles focused on Taiwan than, than elsewhere. Mainland China also does more trade with Taiwan. It's kind of like enveloping Taiwan already, plus the demonstration effect of what happened in Hong Kong, which goes both ways. It scares the Taiwanese, but it also may make them more defensive, more willing to defend their island. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, 
so last question before we bring in some other um, speakers on this panel. Um, how would we have to go about with the war in Ukraine? I mean, what would be the most, would be the, the wisest path to take now? Biden has done an excellent, the Americans have done an excellent job, I think, by, um, I mean, indeed, getting the hardware to the front line by cyber um, um, organizing it and convincing the Europeans to uh, do their bit. I think if I'm rightly informed that the Europeans actually asked Americans to do less, but the Americans convinced the Europeans to do more. Um, how to go about now? Well, I think over the next two months, we're going to see tens of billions of dollars of military equipment flow into Ukraine from the West. Some of it has arrived, but a lot of it hasn't. Um, and that's going to have an effect on the battlefield. You know, it has to. And it has to have an effect on Ukrainian morale, you know, because it has to. You know, morale is a big factor in war. All the historians write about this. Yeah. And, um, the Peloponnesian and, and wars. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it goes back that far. And in terms of the morale issue, the Ukrainians have won, uh, you know, or have been winning thus far in, in, in a very big way. So let's wait a little bit till all the armor arrives. Uh, I, get, I would suppose, I would guess that the Biden administration's policy is, this is, you know, history has given us an historic opportunity to really weaken Russia. Um, and we can't not take it, you know. We have to take it, but we want to do it in a way that doesn't lead to something horrific happening. Uh, such as a, a, a nuclear explosion in the air that is not a test, you know, or, or you know, or, or um, a breakdown of authority in Russia that leads to chaos or something like that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, I think there are real, uh, real honest arguments going on in the Biden administration about how hard to push. And whether or not, and this has become a cliche already, you know, whether or not to give Putin an off-ramp. Yeah, yeah. Or get rid of them altogether. Right. Yeah. And bleeding the Russians white in the meantime. Yeah. 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 That's the harsh reality of geopolitics. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, when it comes to warfare, yes. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, at this point, I'd like to bring in uh, uh, the next speaker of our panel, Natalia Antelava. Um, please have a seat. Welcome to you. <laughs> Wonderful to have you. Um, uh, let me briefly introduce you. Um, a Georgian journalist, co-founder of Coda Story, a news platform specialized in crisis reporting. Emmy nominee and award-winning journalist, among uh, others, uh, the European Press Prize, also um, uh, former BBC correspondent in the Caucasus, Central Asia, Middle East, Washington DC and India, uh, published in The Guardian, CNN, New Yorker, among many others. Um, uh, again, very warm welcome to you. Um, you had a busy weekend as well because you were here on our Belarusia program on Saturday. We had many panels and talks on uh, uh, Belarusia. Um, and wonderful that you can join in tonight as well. Um, um, uh, Natalia, if I may, um, if you listen to the introduction of uh, Robert Kaplan and, um, and, and to our uh, f first conversation, what would be your first reaction to his? Yes, I took uh, notes on all the things that I just you took, yeah, you're, you're a great journalist. So, <laughs> <laughs> so choose one or the main. <laughs> so I think the main thing that um, I actually genuinely disagree with um, is... Disagree with, good. Disagree I'm with. I'm happy, that's always is good. That <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I know what I'm here for. Um, is that Putin evolved. I don't think Putin evolved. I think Putin was and is a KGB man. And um, the United States, as a country that fought the Cold War and won the Cold War and fought it for decades, should have known what it means to be the KGB man. He is a man who was always obsessed and always glorified the Soviet Union. Um, and so I agree with you, he's not a Hitler, but he is a Stalin, um, you know, the only Georgian that he probably respects. And, um, he, 
you know, he's doing what he always told us he would do. He's bringing the Soviet, um, that, I mean, failing to bring it back, thankfully. But, um, you know, he always, that, that was always on the cards from the very start. The glory of Russia and the greater Russia and the Russian Empire. Um, his love for the Soviet Union, because, you know, he was, he, he's the man who called the collapse of the Soviet Union the greatest catastrophe of the um, 20th century. Mm -hmm. And uh, he did everything from, you know, setting up an alternative unions to um, the wars in, you know, in, in South Ossetia, the Russian policies in Moldova, in Transnistria, uh, Belarus, just across the former Soviet Union. Um, he always, you know, tried to keep the pieces of empire. And his anger and um, his hatred was always very clearly directed against the West. Mm -hmm. It was never directed against the, you know, against the Georgians or the Ukrainians and so on. And we, he, was, he always sort of presented himself as someone who is protecting the others from, from the United States primarily, but also by, by default Europe as well. And, and, and if he didn't uh, evolve, what would that mean if he would have been sort of the emperor from the start? If he wouldn't have been. Um, no, no, I mean, what, what would that imply? Would that make a difference in your view that Indeed, he was from the start. Um, so does that, does that imply that we had the wrong reaction to him all from the start? We yeah, I think so. I mean, basically, mm -hmm. that's what I'm... Uh, mm -hmm. I, think, I, I think the writing was on the cards from the very beginning. And I think, um, you know, obviously, there were, there were sort of periods where Putin, in the very start, when he took over from Yeltsin, was talking about a possibility of Russia joining NATO and so on. Yeah, exactly. But the... Um, but what he did, uh, you know, the way kind of Russia, uh, the, the way he took the politics domestically, um, and also, you know, the intel. I mean, this is why countries have intelligence services, I suppose. Like, even even despite what, what he said, the fact that he came from the KGB background, he was a KGB man, and he never um, tried to hide his love for the Soviet Union. Very genuine, very genuine admiration for the Soviet Union, which is shared to this day by many in Russia. Um, and you know, that should have been the first. Um, sort of warning sign uh, that the West could have acted upon, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I think um, whether or not he evolved or not, you know, is a question, you, you know, is a question of interpretation. But I would say that I, I'm not a determinist. I don't think it was, it was or preordained that he would invade Ukraine in the manner that he did. You know, circumstances matter as they evolved. If NATO expansion had gone differently than it did, uh, a whole new set of the storyline, the plot line would have been different. Yeah, with that I completely agree. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, it's not that we knew in 1989 that we, he would invade Ukraine in 2022. You know, one event leads to the other. Kind of. And of course, there were people who predicted Crimea it, in 2008. It's like what I said over dinner. It's all about geography and geopolitics till it becomes all about Shakespeare, you know? And with Putin is where we're dealing with the Shakespearean element. You know, you know the, the, the effects on him of, sir, uh, of, of various things that not only that happened in Russia, but that the West did. Um, I, I agree that a lot could have done very different, and I agree that we didn't have to come to this point at all. I think this was fully avoidable, but it was avoidable not because Putin evolved and changed, um, but it was because the West didn't react on time. Uh, when Russians bombed Georgia in 2008, mm. the bombs that were dropped said for NATO on them. Um, Georgia was being punished for its, you know, basically ambition to protect its own sovereignty because, you know, in the, in, if you are neighbors with Russia, that's the only way to protect yourself. Um, there were people who predicted Crimea, but he got away with it. He got away with the MH17. He got away with Salisbury poisoning. He got away with Navalny. He got away with Syria. He got away with everything, with every murder that was committed um, 
over the past, you know, 15, 15 years. He did. So, yeah, and so he did evolve, it's true, he became bolder, more audacious, um, and arguably pretty insane, um, because it does seem to be insane what he's doing in Ukraine now, in, you know, from his point of view, like, it's not good what he's doing for, for, for Russia and for him power, because it Sure. Do you, do you think that George W. Bush made a mistake by sort of leading Georgia down the garden path of joining NATO when, it was, when he was clearly not serious about defending it? Um, n no, I don't. I no. think Barack Obama made a mistake by presenting Sergei Lavrov with a red button, well, Hillary Clinton did the, uh, you know, was the messenger, um, and offering Russia to reset relations um, and start, you know, offering Russia a fresh start uh, so soon after um, the invasion of Georgia. Yeah. And um, so do you think that we could have prevented, if you're right about... Um, the psychological makeup and the Shakespearean period we're now in um, of, 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 of Putin, um, the fact that he might have learned in a way, in a very dark way from his violence, um, that we should have reacted to his wars by incorporating, for instance, Ukraine into the NATO? Or other ways, but... Look, um, I mean, in some ways, it's not, you know, this is... Difficult to say, of course, but... It's very difficult to say. I think the, I think the carrot of NATO has been a really good thing for countries like Georgia and, and Ukraine, mm -hmm. uh, because it has kept them on the path of development. Um, personally, sometimes I think whether the carrot is a better thing or, or, or the EU, you know, is kind of dangling the possibility of it is, in fact, better than giving it, giving it to them, because... Um, but um, I think the important thing to, you know, one of the other things that came up during your discussion earlier, which I thought was really interesting, was that, you know, reference to um, strategically Russians got it wrong. Um, but I think, you know... Recently, put, you mean. Recently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think the truth is, um, my, you know, I believe that Putin was never a great strategist. It was never about strategy for Putin. It was, he's a brilliant tactician. And he is amazing at identifying weaknesses and pressing buttons and uh, filling in vacuums. But there was never a big strategy that he tried to, um, you know, there was, a, there was kind of this hypothetical dream of bigger Russia that he sold to the Russians. Um, and there was, uh, and, uh, and mixed up with a lot of hatred for the West and everything, and, and liberal values. And there were tactical victories um, that he achieved and, and enjoyed. But there was not much in between. Um, and, you know, if you think of Russian soft power, Russian soft power, it's not about telling the world how great Russia is. It's about telling the world how terrible the United States is. And they got really far on, you know, using that argument. Um, they've done really well for themselves up until now. Up until a month or two ago. Yeah. yeah. yeah uh, let me add that war... Large-scale warfare is a great clarifying moment. And what it's clarified for Europe is that um, they need the United States, or at least the United States under Joe Biden or some normal president, um, kind of. You know, because, you know, the fact is the United States may, may not be qualitatively better, but it has the geographical landmass, it has the weapons, it has the financial clout, it has all that, and therefore it can take a leadership role and cohere Europe. Um, it was interesting that since the Berlin Wall fell, um, up until now, essentially, uh, you, you know, you, well, after the Berlin Wall fell, Europe said it could do things on its own, you know, that it didn't need the United States. And that's why the George H.W. Bush administration made the initial mistake by, of not 
not defending Bosnia. Because Baker, James Baker, the Secretary of State, said, honestly, the Europeans have been telling us for years and decades they don't need us. Well, here's the first example. You know, let's see how this experiment works. And by the time it turned out it didn't work, the, Clinton was in power, essentially. But I, as I said, you know, big military campaigns are clarifying moments. And therefore, um, I, you know, it, what, it, what it's clarified is that, you know, is that the United States is a necessary leader of the West at this, at, at this juncture, at least. It, it clarifies and, again, you mean now, yeah. yeah. And, I, and I think oh, yeah. it, it, was, it is equally another hugely clarifying thing that happened is the Sweden and um, um, uh, Finland's me a bid for NATO because that really uh, crashes that ha that you know myth of the anti-NATO rhetoric that Putin uh, the Russians have used very successfully with the European with the Europeans and with Westerners in general. So you know, it's kind of the actions speak for themselves. Yeah, I, and, and also the. Uh, the Swedes in particular had this image, which was untrue and unfounded, of being like a weak neutralist nation, where in fact the Swedes for decades have been the best uh, diesel submariners in the world. Um, they're so good that the American Navy has imported Swedish warships to play war games against. Um, uh, 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 essentially, like mimicking the Chinese. So that, you know, Sweden and Finland are significant military powers. I um, want to um, go to a short um, intermezzo um, uh, interlude. We've asked uh, actress Julia Rice to read a passage from Tolstoy. We thought it might be uh, a good idea to t bring Tolstoy into the conversation um, because we're talking about. Um, 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 a great historical movement, and there's this wonderful novel, of course, War and Peace. It maybe might be the best novel ever written, but there's a part in the back which is left out in many editions, which is about on the character of history, on the nature of history. And Tolstoy writes extensively about it, and I love it, the part, that, that last part, because he tries to, to say something about it. You know the nature of history, which he does first in this big novel, and we've um, rather a difficult passage, but we have a passage um, where we um, are going to listen to and then continue our conversation. Okay, I will read a short passage from *War and Peace* by Tolstoy. Um, Napoleon's soldiers, who had a hard time in Russia, arrived in an abandoned Moscow, which was literally on fire. After spending five weeks in Moscow, the French left, followed by a deadly march back when both winter came and supplies were scarce. Of the massive army of more than 466,000 French soldiers that entered Russia, only 40,000 survived. The human mind cannot grasp the causes of events in their completeness. But the desire to find those causes is implanted in the human soul. And the human mind, without considering the multiplicity and complexity of the conditions, any of which taken separately may seem to be the cause, seizes the first approximation to a cause that seems to him intelligible and says, this is the cause. In historical events, where the actions of people are the subject of observation, the first and most primitive approximation to present itself was the will of the gods. And after that, the will of those who stood in the most prominent positions, the heroes of history. But we need only penetrate to the essence of any historic event which lies in the activity of the general mass of the people who take part in it, to be convinced that the will of the historic hero does not control the actions of the mass, but is itself continually controlled. It may seem to be a matter of indifference whether we understand the meaning of historical when events this way or that. Yet there is the same difference between those who say that the people of the West moved on the East because Napoleon wished it, and those who say that this happened because it had to happen, as there is between those who declared that the earth was stationary and that the planets moved around it, 
and those who admitted that they did not know what upheld the Earth, but knew there were laws directing its movement and that of the other planets. There is, and can be, no cause of a historical event except the one cause of all causes. But there are laws directing events, and some of these laws are known to us while we are conscious of others we cannot comprehend. The discovery of these laws is only possible when we have quite abandoned the attempt to find the cause in the will of some one man, just as the discovery of the laws of the motion of the planets was possible only when men abandoned the conception of the fixity of the Earth. Thank you, Julia Rice. Um, rather a difficult passage, but um, in a way, um, harking back to the introduction you gave, um, the first part of your introduction, um, at, at least the, the, the way you uh, made reference to Henry Adams, saying that the, um, the core of the problem in Europe will always be Russia. Um, um, so there's, um, you could say that the Napoleonic Wars were because of the will of Napoleon, uh, that's, that's what also, or you could say it's just an inevitable uh, event, with, it's much bigger than the Shakespearean figure of Napoleon, but uh, it's a, it's a history taking its course from a much. Um, and if you look at your st statement reminding us of Ambassador <laughs> um, uh, Adams, you could conclude that there was no other option than another war with Russia somewhere in the 21st century. Is well, I, you know, he had a startling insight, yeah. which made him appear to be clairvoyant. But the problem with saying that things are inevitable mm -hmm. is that it leads to fatalism. And, and, yeah. and um, I, I read somewhere, oh yes, it was a discussion of the French philo late French philosopher Raymond Aron, mm -hmm. uh, who believed in a probabilistic determinism. Mm -hmm. Means that things are determined, but we don't exactly know to what extent and how, and therefore we have no choice but to, but to combat it, but to fight it or to go along with it, or to, or to a act according to our own human agency, because there is a, such a thing as fate, but we don't know where it enters and where it leaves. It's this uncertainty. And in the case of Russia now, I mean, would, have been, would there have been another, could we have taken another path? Could the Russians and we take another part not See, to be there's a whole other factor that we all know about and that we'll probably discuss later. It's Vlo Volodymyr Zelensky, you know? Who could have predicted that, you know, that's, that such a man, a 44-year-old non-professional politician, comedian, would turn out to be such a charismatic not war a leader? Not a clown. What? Not a clown. Yeah. <laughs> like, who could have predicted this? And this is this is a, a rel this is where it becomes Shakespeare, you know, where um, uh, where it becomes where this w was this situation was hard to imagine. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's very hard for me to address the inevitable question as because I'm someone who both comes from a country that has been at war in, with Russia for with many Putin years, Russia, yeah. um, since the 1990s, really has a very you know, close experience of living next to Russia and the, the entire history is determined by the proximity to Russia. So, um, you know, it's very, it's very hard for me to, like, yes, f to, from that point of view, from that angle, it seemed absolutely inevitable, not necessarily because Russia was doing that, but because the West was not doing anything. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that's yes. the inevitability came from the lack of um, lack of reaction, mm -hmm. lack of response, lack of, yeah, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. lack of really acceptance that of, of, the rea of, what, of the reality on the ground, lack of tuning in into the reality, what the reality was or who, you know, what Russia was, was becoming. Um, so, yeah. In that sense, it was. It seemed. It seemed inevitable, but only because 
it, it was. It was the reality that everyone in that part of the world lives. Um, sorry, the last one. It was the reality that everybody... The reality of, of, of a war with Russia. Mm -hmm. And um, you're rightly saying, so we've been at war with Putin and Russia for a long, long, long time. Hmm? Um, could you explain or do you have any explanation why we never... I mean, are we so callous that we don't care about the Jordans? Is that easy or is, or is that... You know, why did we never, ever react? Are we too scared of Russia? I think, I think there's Russian? a complex answer to that. I think, I think um, and I think there are different reasons uh, in the United States and in, in, uh, in Europe. I think Europe has its own relationship with Russia. I think much of the Western world relates to Russia through the... Um, um, through through Russian culture and Russian literature, and is like not very familiar with the outside, you know, with the kind of the Ukraine or Georgia or Armenia and so on. Um, I think it's also because you know Russians, um, like all authoritarian, non-democratic states, have the luxury of time that Western countries don't, you know, democracy, foreign policy is not democracy's greatest strength because people come and go and then it has to be made up from, from scratch. I remember, um, you know, living in Delhi and um, that is an experience repeated again and again, you know, from in the Middle East, it was the same thing. But in Delhi in particular, you know, the American ambassador changed, obviously, every four years. The Russian ambassador had been there for 16 years. He spoke six Indian languages. He was on first term with most Indian politicians on in, from, from all parties. It's a different relationship um, with the world that the Russians have. So I think, I, I don't think there is a simple answer to that. Mm -hmm. I think it's complicated. Of course, of course. And, and it's the same in the uh, Pacific Islands with the Chinese ambassadors. American ambassadors come and go there, whereas a Chinese ambassador will stay on a Pacific Island for 10 years, know the local language, the dialects. It's a different relationship. And even when you compare, you know, you compare, um, we did a piece recently about sort of Russian propaganda outside of the um, uh, Western world. And uh, Sputnik Radio is one, one of Lebanon's main uh, broadcast, uh, broadcasters on, on radio. Um, but Deutsche Welle, the, the radio sort of went down. This is like importance of independent media and uh, needed to rent out the airtime. So they rented their airtime out to the BBC and the uh, Deutsche Welle and um, Sputnik. And, um, you know, the Lebanese have talked to say, you know, you listen to the Sputnik and it's just a different understanding of local dynamic and um, like how things work. You know, just a completely different, um, sort of much more tuned in, much more on the ground, much more just a, just much more in tune with the audience than, than the Arabic service of the BBC or Deutsche Welle. So it translates across, you know, that institutional kind of knowledge of a state that doesn't have to worry about an election cycle um, creates a pretty, pretty powerful foreign policy. And then yeah. China is an example too. And if we come back to the idea that, yes, it's become inevitable because um, there was no reaction to the aggression uh, which has been uh, played out by, by, by the Russians for, for a long time. Um, I'm a bit puzzled by um, the lack of... of um, um, uh, no, let's put, let put it this way. I mean, I hear a lot that we should take the Russian uh, fragility into account, that we should not, you know, uh, make them angry because, you know, if we, if we widen the NATO or European Union or both or one of them, uh, uh, bring them back, back to the East, you know, we might uh, upset the Russians. And, you know, to me, it sounds pretty much like, you know, please don't upset the English by, uh, for the decolonization process. You know, it sounds like Africans being afraid to, to upset the English by decolonization. I mean, I mean um, Putin in his speech before he invaded Ukraine, denied the existence of the Ukrainian nation, um, which sounds a lot like um, a lot of colonial powers have been doing over the past, you know, 100 and 
200 years, denying that there was anything like, you know, a nation uh, so you could easily colonize, it belongs to you. It, um, um, it seems like we're not at all um, uh, interested in the fact that uh, Belarusians, Ukrainians are nations as such. This is, this is a common uh, theme in imperial history. Churchill said that India was not a real country, it was just a geographical expression. Yeah. And Count Metternich in Austria, in, you know, in the early middle part of the 19th century, said Italy is not a real country, it's just a geographical expression. Uh, this is when the Habsburgs controlled or had serious influence in parts of northern Italy. So this, you know, this, this is common. Yeah. I, th I, th common I agree. Feature of empire. I, think, I think it's a common feature of empire, but I think what makes the Russia situation unique is that I think Western societies in general, from you know, my experience, are very far from um, even accepting Russia as a colonial power. And so are the Russians, you know? If, um, if uh, any British journalist talks to any Indian journalist today, mm -hmm. they the framing of, you know, the, the, the fact that Britain has colonized India will be the big picture behind any conversation that is being had. When I speak to a Russian journalist, they, that is not part of their thinking. I mean, and the, um, I'm talking about sort of liberal, you know, mo mo not all, obviously, there are rare exceptions. But I think, you know, Russians have not even began to accept themselves as a colonial power. And more consequentially, I think, um, the West has not started talking about Russia as a colonial power. And I think that's very obvious in the coverage of this war. You know, it's not being covered as a, um, as a colonial war or a yeah, neo-colonial war. When in war. fact, Ukraine was, was taken by the Romanov dynasty, if I'm not mistaken. So, uh, you know, so Russian imperialism is real, just as, uh, Taiwan was taken by the Chinese under the Qing dynastic empire. Yeah, it's definitely very real. Yeah. <laughs> I can confirm. <laughs> I can confirm it. Yeah, but, but um, coming from Georgia, it might be obvious, because Georgia has been at war with Russia for centuries, uh, being colonized by it. Um, but um, since you also have been working extensively for the BBC and, you know, I mean, how come that nobody here actually looks at that part of the Russian history and puts it in that light? I mean, it's a great question, and I don't have a straightforward answer. I think no, I don't again, expect you to have yes, like a I whole. Think it's again I mean, a but combination of many things. I do think that um, uh, I, I do think that Francis Fukuyama <laughs> is somewhat to blame for. You know that whole end of history narrative was very um, powerful in, mm -hmm. in, in the West, um, that you know all problems were over and we were moving on. I think that's one thing. I think another thing is that the, you know, as it is in sort of the culture through Russian literature, the power of Russian literature, you know, true power of Russian music, literature, culture, um, and the fact that people who explained Westerners, who explained Russia and the Soviet Union, who explained the Soviet Union to, the, to their Western audiences, journalists, you know, academics and so on. They were all, all the Sovietologists were all Russian speakers. They were all looking at the Soviet Union through the prism of, through, through the Russian framing. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think the third element is Russian propaganda is an um, Russian information war has been incredibly potent and very powerful in ways that, you know, I think people don't even fully realize. Yeah, I, I, I would add the Soviet Union simply by existing was an imperial enterprise because of all the republics you know, of different ethnic groups. I think there, there's, uh, first, one thing on Francis Fukuyama, he's very much of a Europeanist. He's focused on the West. 
So his philosophy of that the liberal, you know, the liberal experiment is marching on endlessly and always going forward is a very Western notion. It doesn't take into account other parts of the world and which have their own histories and their own traditions. I think maybe another minor element is that in the West, people have associated imperialism with Britain and France. And, and in tearing themselves apart over guilt because of British and French colonialism. And Russia is just outside that framework. It's just yeah. in a different framework. Yeah. And people who were, you know, sort of reporting on it and explaining it to the West were using the Russian framework uh, to explain it anyway, so thus perpetuating kind of the Russian narratives. And, you know, I think, I mean, this is why it's, uh, fundamentally different now with this invasion because it's the first time when it's the it's the Ukrainians who are telling the story and they're telling it in very you know powerful ways I mean it's a powerful story and they're telling it in very smart very calculated um, politicians not the people way so it's the first time I think where a narrative of a Russian colony a former Russian colony is getting through into the Western bubble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, then the Soviet Union was always anti-colonialist and anti-imperialist in their own description. Yeah, that's and right. And we bought into yeah. that. Yeah. yeah that's, that's right. That's, that, that is by it being repeated throughout the Cold War, yeah, right. it was inculcated. Yeah, it was yeah. just, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, another thing, it always amazes me about how the anti-war coalition and, you know, the anti-war activists in the West uh, will only protest against Na NATO. Uh, but never against, you know, yeah. the Russians in what the Russians are doing in uh, in in Ukraine or elsewhere. So, uh, and I th and I think that's also part of that. Before I go to the next panelist, um, the same question I put to Robert Kaplan. Um, do you think that, um, and he put it very nicely in, yes, there is the problem of imagination again. What do you do? You think that it is remotely possible the Russians will use their nuclear weapons? Well, obviously I have the answer, but I can't tell you. No, yeah. <laughs> You've been phoned by the FSB. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. <laughs> My handlers will punish me. Um, I think at this point everything is possible. I'm really wary of making any predictions because I really don't know how this could end extremely badly or, I mean, in some ways it already ended all ended badly because so many people have already died. But um, yeah, I think hypothetically there is a possibility that a very cornered Putin is a very dangerous Putin, but who might be able to do that. And, you know, we've done a lot of reporting on, there's definitely being upping of the uh, nuclear rhetoric on Russian state television. You know, it's used a lot now. There are all these analysts that come on the Kremlin TV and sort of say, you nuclear, nuclear will, yeah, will we'll nuke Berlin, will nuke Warsaw, will be a race from face of the earth and so on. And I think um, because Moscow, you know, has become so isolated and that, uh, uh, you know, it's kind of self-feeding cycle where, um, you know, it's not clear whether the Kremlin has sent them to say this or they're saying that to please the Kremlin. But in any case, it kind of creates the loop. Um, and will that, and it's, my theory is that it's the same kind of loop that drove Putin to think that um, he could take Kiev in two days and he would be welcomed with, open arms because that's what the Russian television said um, and I think I think I think one of the reasons we are where we are is because you know because of the Russian Russian state TV and that kind of propaganda that instilled that possibility of a, an easy military victory in in Ukraine they clearly didn't expect w what's happening now so it's a I think it's a very dangerous situation but hopefully the back channels are working and people are prepared and we'll manage to avoid it. And hopefully the Chinese did tell them off. Yes, yeah. the yeah. Chinese. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but you do speak Russian. Yes. Yeah, so you do follow the Russian television. We only get snippets, you know, under subtitled, but I, yeah. I, I watch it regularly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And this rhetoric is reinforcing itself. Uh, very much so, yeah, I think so. 
I mean, no one gets to go on the Kremlin CV and say anything without sort of broad agenda points. But Russian disinformation, Russian propaganda is also pretty sloppy. So, you know, and and I think it's people who are trying to outdo themselves. But it's it's a loop. There's no question. This point, I'd like to ask um, our third um, panelist, uh, Martin Rossum, to join us. Please, warm welcome to you too. Um, let me briefly. Let me briefly introduce you too. Welcome, Thank um, you. strategic advisor uh, at the Cambridge Negotiation Institute and former senior advisor to our Prime Minister Mark Rutte, um, Maarten van Rossum, a diplomat. And um, uh, um, I would um, I would wonder how you, um, with your experience in the sort of the diplomatic field, um, first maybe we talked a little bit about Zelensky and indeed. You know, history takes suddenly a different turn because um, uh, we just happen to have a good, well, um, a, a, a man who knows the stage and knows how to talk. And how do you look upon Zelensky's role in playing out the diplomatic um, possibilities he has, his diplomatic cards, um, since it's also your trade? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, well, I think he's doing a, a really good job. Um, I think a few factors that he's playing out really well is to put pressure on the negotiation table. And if there is a negotiation table, but I think your position at the negotiation table is defined on, you know, how good or bad you're doing at, at the battlefield, mm -hmm. but also how successful you are in lining up your, your stakeholders that can influence uh, the course of events. And I think he's doing a really good job at that, uh, you know, basically going on a world tour since the beginning, you know, his famous tweet of I don't need a ride, I need ammo. And uh, from that point on, he started to, you know, uh, show people that, you know, you can do something against this, we can do this together. And he's constantly, I think, tapping into that uh, emotion. Uh, he's going to every parliament, you can see this, going on shared values, uh, talking about events in the past, like Rotterdam uh, in the Netherlands, today even at the WEF, where you know, people have their great foods, and, or the World Economic Forum, sorry, in Davos. Uh, you know, uh, it's, of course, a, a fest of caviar and champagne. He said there, uh, let's uh, help us secure the food from, uh, from the Ukraine. So these kinds of tapping into uh, current events, uh, but also national uh, traumas and even Shakespearean to be or not to be in, in the British uh, Parliament. I think he's doing a really good job. And from a negotiations perspective, um, I think what he's doing is setting very high aspirational goals and then also making them actionable for the leaders he's talking to. So, for instance, in the Netherlands, he said, Mark Rutte, you know, with our Ukrainian uh, uh, referendum uh, experiences. Yeah. Um, Mark Rutte, when can I become a member of the European Union? And that's like, that's such a high aspirational goal. I think under normal circumstances, no one would have ever considered it. But uh, now it's like, you know, to the Dutch people, it makes sense. And um, also the way he, you know, he dresses, of course, the way he talks to people addressing the Russians in Russian. Um, I think he's doing, uh, he's doing a really good job. Good. <laughs> That's, and um, so he's mixing public diplomacy with. Um, uh, uh, so he's using, and he's using a, a every possibility he's got. Um, but zo and zooming in a little bit on this European Union issue, because we, that's been sort of the elephant in the conversation up until now. Mm -hmm. We've talked about NATO, we've talked about the Chinese. Um, um, uh, do you think there's a bonus, a carrot, as you put it uh, b b before, uh, for Ukraine to, to be working on, to be entering the European, European Union even though it looked like no, that was never going to happen? I think, yeah, the biggest weapon right now is basically uh, leaving it over the market, right? Uh, because entering into the European Union is a different game. And I would say from a negotiations perspective, this is also the time for the European Union to then say <laughs> which conditions you would like to see uh, met. Because, you know, giving away something right now uh, is probably done in, you know, in the, in the, in the emotion of the hour. Spur and of the moment, yeah. Yeah, yeah. spur of the moment. And, um, yeah, that could... could uh, uh, you know, if they would become a member right now, we would have uh, probably a very long path of uh, a lot of trouble in getting the Ukrainians to also uh, uh, adhere to, well, the European core values. And 
um, at that point, I think what, what what's interesting right now is what the European Union and the Americans are doing is not so much, I think, a, a counter strike, but is really a counter attack. When you look at um, at the sanctions, but also bringing in uh, all the weaponry, uh, the Americans even bring in the airborne divisions. So you know, I'm wondering what the bigger plan there is. You put so much pressure on. They bring on in the 82nd and the one and the 101st or something. Isn't it? The, the 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 divisions who did the. Uh, 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 Where are they bringing them into Poland and Poland. Romania? Yep. Yeah. And that, I think, well, you can threaten, of course, with nuclear weapons from one side. But if you do this, what signal does it send, right? And what's the bigger plan there? And I think, you know, this now sort of leads to escalation and, you know, diplomats <laughs> don't like escalation unless it's, it's, it's functional, right? Mm -hmm. And at this point, uh, I'm one, and the question you asked on the, on the, the you know, the, the use of nuclear weapons, um, I think becomes uh, more evident the more pressure we put on him uh, as a group, and I was, and I think you were alluding to that as well. At some point, I think we should find a way out uh, also, and that I think is the hopefully the back channeling that is going on right now. At what point? Uh, and you saw a piece in the New York Times on this as well. At what point, and with 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 which pieces of land? Could we resolve this, right, and find a way out a face-saving strategy for both sides? Which is, I mean, it's a very. Uh, I think there is no way to to save face in such a horrible uh, uh, conflict. But where are, where else would this lead? So, but that's more from a negotiations perspective. I think if you look at the realpolitik part of this, um, I think it's our common uh, uh, task to defeat. Uh, uh, to defeat Putin in this and at least get him out of, uh, of the Ukraine and make sure uh, that this will not happen again. Mm -hmm. um, um, that's a totally different approach. Uh, at least at, at some point this war has to end, of course, that's, uh, that, that, that's obvious. It's a totally different approach than uh, was sketched out by Robert Kaplan by saying at this point, you know, um, in history, there's an opportunity to finally get at the Russians and yep. you know, bleed them white. Um, that's what I said, of course, <laughs> but um, I don't well, want to put that. That seems to be the tact that the uh, Biden administration is taking okay. now, especially yeah. from, uh, from Defense Secretary Austin's remark that we want to weaken Russia, which to say publicly as he did was an incredible statement. Yeah, no, and I agree, but I think uh, if you look at it a, a little bit, maybe a weird uh, uh, comparison, but if you look at it from a, a parent-kid uh, perspective, I see China as the parent right now, and the kid that is being aggressive all the time and is not punished at all is Russia. And we think we are punishing uh, Russia big time with our sanctions, but on the other hand, the FDI, because I missed the economic component a little bit in the discussion from uh, the FDI is coming in from China. Uh, energy projects, like you alluded to, uh, are being uh, signed and sealed at a, a bigger value than what we are uh, punishing them for. So uh, I think unless uh, China is willing to really take a stance, and of course I think the danger for China right now is that their whole uh, global supply chain is also being uh, you know, messed up a little bit, and Putin is not doing things really right, but I think together, uh, Russia and China, but this is real big steps in geopolitics, mm -hmm. are really trying to do the same as the Biden administration is doing, uh, trying to hit Russia. I think these two are trying to hit the global system and saying we should go to a multipolar world and this is our chance. I see mm -hmm. you agree on this one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> on, on, on this one, yes. On the previous one, I did. Yeah, yeah. On this one, you do agree? So it's, a, it's also a possibility, a chance, really, for China and Russia to step in and to to become on on par with the rest with the West. Well, yeah, I would, I maybe would, to just to elaborate a little bit on this yeah, one. Please. If you see, I find it interesting that you see the whole Western world going out, and the Chinese are going in. So yeah. what's the new moral yardstick? Yeah, McDonald's is one of the last to move out, but yes, all all the oil companies moved out already. You know, two months ago. Yeah. yeah, the FMCGs, and you see this going. It's it now. I think the West is more used to this. Uh, we saw the same in Myanmar, you know, every Western company that was there had to go out. And then <laughs> through the back door, the Chinese and the Russians come in. So I think on a longer term, mm -hmm. it's interesting to see what our global strategy is, basically, because we are declining in our global economic footprint. And, you know, back in the, in the day, that used to be uh, the stabilizing force in the world, right? You had trade relations and then things were better again. That obviously has changed, uh, but I do think we have to rethink our longer-term 
uh, perspective, because if we all move out and the others move in, then we're left with nothing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's that's uh, uh, what Gerbert Kaplan said at the end. You know, we have a, a, a return of the autocrats. Uh, 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 several factors. It's a it's a uh, it's a claustrophobic world, um, and the end of the free trade. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you don't seem to agree, Natalia. Well, I think the rhetoric of helping Putin save face is self-defeating, dangerous, and will inevitably lead to um, ensuring that. It is going. It will happen again, because that is exactly what the West has done over the past 15 years: was let Putin save face, make sure we don't humiliate Russia. Mm -hmm. So to hear that now, um, considering everything that's going on, is you know really interesting how how strong that still is. I mean, it's not just you; it's Macron as well, and other people who are saying, "Well, Putin needs to save face." Um, I think that's just self-defeating. I think that will be that is yet again letting him get away with it. I think the only way to move on is to make sure that Putin loses in this war um, and in fact doesn't save face. Mm -hmm. And I think everything else it puts the world and you know kind of Western liberal world order into a greater danger than it is now and wastes an opportunity that the Ukrainians have already paid for with their lives. And the Dutch have as well Exactly. Um, in 2014. Um, yeah, um, what I would say is we've just had an earthquake with the invasion of Ukraine. And saving face from when Putin came into power in 2000, 2001, whenever it was, um, up until the invasion of Ukraine was self-defeating, as you said. But at the end of this, Putin, no matter how this turns out, is probably going to be much weaker than he was before. He's got to be, with Scandinavia coming into NATO. Um, and um, I don't think the Turks are going to be able to stop that. That's a whole other thing. Um, you know, his, his army has been really beaten down. You know, he may need to do a partial mobilization, you know, and that could could be problematic for him in other ways. So if he saves some face after this cataclysm, it would be in a different context. It would be in a context of him already being beaten down and weakened and humiliated. So it's not really about saving face. It's about getting to a point where this ends without some horrible cataclysm, such as the, an explosion of a nuclear weapon or chaos in Moscow, you know? It, Absolutely, but we're now yeah. talking about sort of the fear of Chinese going in and using it as an opportunity, and that's why maybe the West should still be considering trading with, uh, you know, let him save face and consider it trading with Russia? Is that what you were no, saying, no, no. or did I miss it? No, I was just appealing to making, maybe also thinking in the West a little bit uh, for long term, how do we deal with these kind of conflicts? This one is very close to our house, but we've seen him uh, all over the place, of course, and uh, if the strategy is constantly uh, pull out and let the others come in, then you know you see you're just basically pulling back behind the dikes, as we say in Dutch. And uh, I, I think I, I agree with Robert. It's more of finding a way out, and I called it face saving. Sorry for that, but uh, it, we have to find a way out of this because uh, we had the same uh, in uh, in the trade deal with the United States. Um, when there was, uh, we, we had this trade war going on between China and the US and then uh, Trump also decided to punish uh, us. And after the first uh, round, so basically look at it from a soccer game perspective, it was 1-0 for the United States. Then we, we came up with a very nice 1-1, which was uh, blocking Harley Davidson and Levi's jeans. We thought it was brilliant. Um, and actually, I was quite uh, surprised that all the smart heads in Brussels, uh, they teach their kids in, in the morning, if you see a bully on the schoolyard, just walk away and it'll probably end. Um, but they now came up with the idea of making it 1-1, right, in soccer terms. So we came up with this really tough uh, counter uh, attack. And then at that point, we had to find a way out, a face-saving strategy for Trump. And um, there was basically a very high, uh, low sacrifice, but very high value option for him was uh, to lower the tariffs on US cars in Europe, basically making them, them the same uh, tariffs as for European cars. 
And uh, with that, our prime minister went that way, basically proposing that you know that he could rally for that in the European Union. And ultimately, that became the deal because you know he could say, well, I won because I got the Europeans on their knees. This is an economic conflict, but different. I want you to, to see the dynamics that. Uh, you know, we could have gone endlessly uh, battling uh, with our, basically with our best ally across the pond on trade sanctions, but ultimately, I think at that point, we chose to say, okay, well, let's, uh, let's give him uh, that, and he can, uh, we had a lot of Democrats who were not happy with us, well, let's give him that so that we can end this uh, war, because a lot of, well, things are destroyed. Our relation with the US was one of them. So, yeah. I think my mic, oh, it's still, it's working, it's up again. Um, but this is, uh, please, go ahead, because I see, it's, you already said it, this is not a trade war, of course. It's this is not a trade war. I mean, we're talking about mass rape, bombardment, uh, endless victims, torture, you know, um, a completely different scenario. No, no, like, I agree, but I'm just showing the dynamics in any, ne any diplomatic negotiation. Mm -hmm. You should find a way out, and the subject is... 200% different, maybe 1,000% different. And, and but if you don't find a way out, this will continue. No, no, and that so, so, so let's think that through for a moment. I heard the French president say that the Ukrainians cannot enter for another 15 years. And that sounds like a long period. But what I heard was that the French president said, yes, they can enter. That's basically what he said. He said, not now and nah. But, um, um, which is a totally different thing from the French. I mean, they've been so uh, accommodating to Putin that it's almost... Uh, incredible, I would mm. say. But um, um, so, what would, as a negotiator, what would that scenario look like? And, um, you know, where's the way out? Yeah, what do you want to yeah. do first? This question? Awesome. awesome. And, <laughs> and yeah. then. No, this is kind of like part of this question, actually. Like, why ca can't the way out be putting Putin's military, de military defeat? Why is it on you to find the way out for him? And not on him to find a way out. But I think uh, mm -hmm. on the military defeat, he's going, he's doing a great job himself. Let's say uh, we can only support, but also, you know, the, I think if you in any negotiation, if you put too much pressure on somebody, they'll break, mm -hmm. and they'll they'll search for their whatever you call a red line, your bat now, whatever. But that's that's a dangerous point, and. Uh, if we bring him too close or over that point, and I'm not talking about face saving for him, and this is basically saving also the the, um, uh, the but not not exploding it into a, into a conflict beyond Russia and and Ukraine. And believe me, I, I think it's horrible what we see, and I find it heartwarming. In this, I live in the Hague, the streets of the Hague now. If you look, uh, go up to the Russian embassy, but even on on any startup thing, you see Ukrainian flags waving. Uh, well, that was not really our voting behavior back in the day, but uh, now it's different, right? Everybody supports uh, the Ukraine. But at a certain point, I think we should... We, uh, my, my appeal is we have to find a way out of this. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, you know, it's interesting. <clears throat> the downfall of the last czar really began with his defeat in the Russo-Japanese War, where he was really humiliated in 1905. But even then, it wasn't fate because had he not joined up in World War I, who knows what would have happened. Maybe the Bolsheviks never would have come to power. Um, you know, this is the theme of Solzhenitsyn's first book, August 1914, um, on, you know, on the Russian Revolution. And, um, you know, we're, we're talking around a subject is, this all goes back to Moscow. This all ends somewhere in Moscow at some point, where if he's, if he's really defeated, this, I would think this would have to have political consequences in Moscow, but maybe not tomorrow. You know, it may take a few years, you know? Other things may have to happen, but I, we'd be at the start of some adventure where this would go back to Moscow eventually. That's right. I think if we leave him alone, he will do just fine screwing it up for himself. <laughs> but it's finding the way out for him is, um, or, or the negotiation. I mean, at some point, the Ukrainians will probably have to sit down with him. But, you know, sh it should be their terms surely yeah yeah but i think they are right and but every day you see now the russians are they don't want to negotiate anymore and then the ukrainians don't want to negotiate anymore depending on the situation or what we get uh the information we get from the battlefield so at a certain point i, I agree they have to sit down but um 
you only sit down and you negotiate real negotiations, right? Not the ones where you try to save time or face or do a, do a charade. But the real negotiations should take place at a, at a point when there's a bit of an equi equilibrium and where both parties can win. And now I see the, the demands of Putin were so high when going in. Uh, and I think the whole world agreed with the demands of the, uh, of, of the Ukraine, right? Because it was basically leave our country, leave us alone. Uh, that was basically their uh, take on life. So, you know, uh, everybody uh, could agree to that. But the Russian uh, demands were so high uh, that uh, no one would agree to that. It's, it's pure aggression. And to bring those two together in the negotiation table is super hard. You know... Um, I was just talking to um, someone in Georgia. Georgia celebrates the um, an Independence Day this this week, and it's an Independence Day from the um, 20, um, 1918, when Georgia briefly became independent from the Russian Empire and had one of the most liberal constitutions in Europe. And women had universal suffrage. And for two, for about two years, you know, there was this four years. There was this like moment of hope and um, parliament and all of that. And then the Bolsheviks rolled in and it was all over for 70 years. And um, it's only recently, so this, these journalists that I was talking to were contacted by the Ukrainians um, who asked them to, um, if they could provide them with the evidence of Russian atrocities in Georgia. So they started digging into the archive and kind of were shocked by um, themselves by what they discovered. And one of the stories, I was going through the material that they got, and one of the stories is a story in, from Abkhazia of the school um, where, um, and, you know, both sides committed terrible atrocities in that war, but, you know, a story of Russian and Abkhaz soldiers um, holding up three, about 300 um, people from the village um, in, in the school and um, separating men and women and systematically raping the women women and some some of them girls as young as as the young as nine um, and many of the men sort of never appeared stories that are extremely similar to what we're seeing and this in, is this in was Ukraine the today. war on this is, Asia, uh, this is 1993 um, Georgia was pushed ever since then and obviously a lot of mistakes were made by the Georgian government but the 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 pressure from the Western Europe was always to sit down and talk to the Russians it was always to sit down and talk to the Russians. And I honestly don't think we would have Ukraine today if there had been a different policy and if that pressure had not been there. Because it yeah. doesn't get you anywhere talking to the Russians. No, but I, I, and I saw, uh, you know, I saw the debate yesterday between you and Ruben Brekemans, a member of parliament, here at the Bali as well. And I, but I'm then interested in, if you look at the long-term perspective of Russia, where is this heading? So post-Putin, eh? let's, let's, let's imagine a little bit. Uh, at a certain point, I think the new generation uh, of his entourage also uh, looks at what, am I, what are we left with uh, after he has left, right? And then looking at, at what you're basically saying is, so what would be your advice to the West, and what would what should we do? Should we go in full fledged, like okay, the airborne divisions worry me a little bit, but what do we do then? What's your what's your plan with Putin? If we don't need to sit down with him, what do we do? I think you l make sure that Ukraine wins the war um, militarily, and then you know keep the sanctions as they are, make them stronger, stop relying on the Russian gas, um, you know, oil embargo, um, put pressure on them and um, support um, the countries that are, you know, that deserve um, support of the West. Yeah, but Robert, and that's, what, that's what we're doing right now. And it leads us to, I think, a very long frozen conflict with Russia, unless there's some external event or some way out offered to Putin and his friends. But that's... My take. Uh, I would say, um, we talked about this before, I'm very suspicious of a frozen conflict because you've, all the frozen conflicts have been in small places. This is too big with too many moving parts, with $40 billion in arms coming in. So a frozen conflict is actually a kind of an idealistic scenario because it implies a certain amount of stability. 
um, which may not exist in this conflict. So, and as I said before, I think that you know the, the, the train has left the station. The Biden administration is going for a victory or, or something close to it that would really weaken, uh, you, know, you know, defense secretaries usually speak very understatedly. You, you know, you know when, when General Austin, a former General Austin said, um, we want to weaken Russia, what he really meant was we want to pummel and destroy Russia, you know, uh, um, essentially. That, you know, that was the implication of that statement. So I think that's the direction where we're headed. And it, you know, we'll see if it's a frozen conflict. You know, I mean, Russia now will try to link up with uh, Crimea because they've taken Mariupol, mm -hmm. and they'll probably uh, issue passports and send in the ruble in Luhansk and Donetsk and all of that, and you know, to claim some sort of a victory or something. That's how I see things going now. But I don't know what happens after all this weaponry flows in. You know, uh, with the with the morale side of the conflict on the side of the Ukrainians. So we have um, a way out for ever, all the parties and the sit down. We have a moral obligation, maybe, to finally tell off uh, the child in the Kremlin, which got away with everything. From a moral point of view, and we have the train has left the station. Americans have made a decision; it will end, you know, differently than the Europeans uh, imagine. Um, uh, thank you very much up until now for your uh, uh, wonderful conversation. I'm going to the hall like we always do here. We always have a moment to, for the people to join in, um, see whether there are any questions. Um, remember, a question is a, a sentence with a question mark at the end. <laughs> um, uh, and um, I'll be... Um, uh, Gatol is going to come to you with the microphone because the people at home are listening in. We have a live stream. Uh, let's see whether there might be any questions. I, I see the gentleman over here with the blue... Um, <laughs> the blue... I have a short question. Is China getting weaker now at the moment or is it getting stronger? Uh, China? Uh, China is getting weaker. Its growth rate is going down from double digits to high single digits to maybe low single digits. Um, the way they're dealing with COVID is going to hurt the economy dramatically also. The Chinese economy is maturing, which where it's harder to grow. It's a, the population is aging. And the most important thing is that she, by becoming more of a statist, by implanting the state, deeper and deeper into the Chinese economy is killing the, is killing the golden goose that laid all the eggs, essentially. You, know, you can't have this level of new ideology, communist ideology in the system, with, and still get yesterday's economic growth rates. So I think, I think it's interesting that the, the, the Russia is clearly in decline. Um, China is weakening. And the United States has its social, cultural, economic problems, which is, you know, it's a real divided society, even though we've had like, an, you know, an impressive performance in the foreign policy realm by the Biden administration, at least so far. Also of conflict, eh? What is it's, the effect? Um, it's, it's ambivalent, I'm not sure, uh, you know, in terms of this conflict, because, um, China's supply chains have been hurt by this conflict. Um, they can probably extract more gas at a cheaper price from Russia at this conflict, so it gains a bit. And probably the biggest thing that the Chinese gain at this point is the Americans are distracted. They're concerned with Russia. Yep, uh, no. <laughs> Uh, my question is actually a comment that will probably lead to question. Why isn't mm. communism spelled out as the explanation uh, that a Russian wasn't taken Russia wasn't taken serious as an opponent anymore? The, it was the, the establishment of world-embracing communism. When that was defeated in 1991, Russia as such was not taken serious as an opponent. And I think that uh, all the uh, conflicts that we've discussed are actual 
uh, were seen as erratic or slightly deranged behavior, but not really dangerous for Europe. And the moment that you got the attack to Ukraine, that changed the attitude, and by adding uh, Finland and uh, Sweden to the equation, uh, Russia is basically blocked because it cannot even move into the Baltics. So why wasn't communism mentioned as the main explanation why we were, didn't take, an, take Russians serious anymore? Whereas the Putin gang actually lost one important propaganda tool, communism, which would resonate with many sympathizers worldwide, and they have worked overtime to create new alternative propaganda devices to get people resonate with, with Russia. Th that is a question and a comment at the same time. Um, um, so, I mean, I think you can flip that as well and um, ask why has the West not taking its victory in the Cold War seriously enough? Um, had there been a Marshall Plan for Russia, would we be in a different place today? Had there been not this kind of crazy capitalism on steroids that created all the oligarchs and then went and, you know, ruined London and brought their corruption to the West. Would we be in a different place? Um, so I don't know if it answers it, but I'm not sure it was a question. So there you go. <laughs> Do I see any other? Yeah, I see one other. You mentioned the Marshall Plan, and I don't know if this is going to be an intelligent question or not, but especially the journalists from Georgia, uh, if I were Russian and I'm hearing everybody speak right now, I, I can't f avoid the feeling, having the feeling that the West is against Russia, sort of strengthening Putin's arm, hand. So instead of like the approach that seems to be here is that we're going to use the Versailles Treaty, what happened there, let's humiliate Germany and they'll never start a war with us again. Fast forward a couple of years and everybody knows that what happened was the Second World War. And also I think everybody's underestimating how much support Russia has outside of Europe and the West. India, Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, I can go on and on. So would you care to comment a little bit? Maybe the, especially the gentleman from the Netherlands mentioned, you know, like the off-ramp. There should be an off-ramp. I don't see Russia being totally humiliated as a solution in the long term. So there's a difference between Russia and Putin, by the way. Yeah. Um, sadly, I mean, I think that's... Um Obviously, there is a difference between Russia and Putin, but I think with Navalny in jail and opposition outside of Russia, um, or obliterated completely, on many of them killed, that was should have been another, right? Nemtsov's killing, like everyone, <laughs> he was allowed to get away with that too. Um, uh, so um, I think Putin, you know, is Russia, and I think around his in in his inner circle. Not that I have any insights into his inner circle, but I don't think that any replacement of Putin will be very different from what we have today, possibly worse. Mm, it is very hard for me as you know, and I'm mixing personal and professional here because it is very hard for me as a Georgian and as a person who comes from a country, 20% of which is occupied by Russia and has witnessed firsthand many of the atrocities that Russia has committed. Um, it's very hard for me to understand how there can be an off ramp because an off ramp for Putin today is an existential threat to Moldova, to Georgia, um, to the countries that are a low hanging fruit for him after you know he's allowed to um, survive and not lose um, Ukraine. Um, but I agree with you, I'm completely aware and I am in touch with many people who continue to support, um, support Russia and are actually on Russia's side in, the, in, in this war. And um, that's right, I think um, Russians have really focused, they parked Western Europe and the United States for a bit where they were extremely active with their anti-LGBTQ propaganda, with their family values narratives, with their you know, far-right anti-immigration narratives. Russians really um, did a lot to sow divisions within the Western and European societies. They seem to have parked it in the moment. They're really focusing on Africa. They're focusing on Latin America um, and, um, and Asia. Um, and 
you know, for countries like India and uh, for countries that have experienced European colonialism, uh, you know, there are a genuine alternative. You can also understand that for countries, for the Middle East that has experienced, um, you know, America's uh, occupation and wars. Um, you know, the what about argument uh, that Russians present and feed to those audiences works really, really well and continues to do so. So, um, it's really hard to, and I think it's really important, like one thing that wasn't mentioned at all, I mean, Robert talked about the tech uh, revolution and everything that technology played. I think technology is currently playing an incredibly dangerous role. The technology that we have today is playing incredibly dangerous role at further polarizing and dividing the societies because our information landscape has been completely warped by um, big, monopolies on the conversations that we are having. The public square has been hijacked by meta, by, you know, and uh, and their algorithms. Um, and I think that makes, um, and, and the autocrats of this world, and I'm not talking just about Putin, but also Erdogan and Modi and all the others, you know, they they know that and they've been really good at manipulating it. And I think um, I think there still is a real chance that you know Russia um, Russia will win this. Yeah, maybe to add why a lot of people are always so disappointed in diplomatic solutions is because diplomacy is nothing less than the art of the possible at that point. And I think looking at the possibilities right now, now is not the time to like you said, make an offer to Russia. Uh, again, I'm not trying to help Russia, but it's more like if you want to have a way out of any conflict, there should be a win-win uh, in it for both parties. Otherwise, uh, so either we have to cripple him further and that'll take some more time, I think. So we're not looking at that point right now. Um, uh, or the negotiations should take place. And that means uh, a movement from Russia as well. And they will probably not move to the table right now because, you know, one day they're winning, the other day they're losing. So in that sense, I think they are not ready to negotiate or genuinely negotiate right now. Thank you very much. Um, I think uh, we've come to the end of our... Um of our evening, and there's many more questions. I'm aware of that. I'm terribly sorry, but <laughs> but um, there's a, a, a third half, I would say, at the bar. Um, uh, so please join us uh, uh, to talk. Um, for me personally, it was an amazingly um, enlightening evening. Thank you very, very much for uh, all three of you for uh, joining in conversation. Uh, globalization 2.0, uh, a sort of uh, a bleak perspective on the next second decade. I mean, the, the next decades of our of our century. Uh, make no mistake about it. You said there will be a cold war between China and the U.S., which we haven't delved into. But that's the background, of course, of this conflict. There will be consequences taken home to the Kremlin, and there will be a new story evolving from the from the all-out war in Ukraine, um, which actually brings us to the Pacific and the Pacific theater, um, which we haven't discussed at length, but that's behind of all of this. That's pretty bleak if you compare it with the return of the aut aut autocracy, with the uh, angst of the middle class, with the world of uh, the ending world of free trade, which we've mentioned, and with uh, the tech surveillance, which has been uh, a real tool in the hands of the new aut autocrats. So um, we have our uh, work uh, uh, put out for ourselves. Um, I'm, I'm terribly sorry that I can't give you any more upbeat uh, conclusion than this. Although, on the other hand, the return of history for an historian is very hopeful, I would say. Um, there's possibilities. There's not only possibilities for the Chinese and the Russians, there are possibilities actually for uh, the Western Alliance. For the first time, a very good friend of mine this morning uh, reminded me, for the first time in a long time, an American president used the free West as an uh, as uh, two words which are, were not um, ironical or cynical, but really said it in uh, uh, in the uh, uh, in his speech to the nation, Joseph Biden. So there there are possibilities uh, uh, all around, uh, I would say, and there's the possibility that the train has left the station and that we eventually will replace Putin and try to have a new successful democracy. Uh, the Ukraine added to the Western Alliance. So um, <laughs> that's are just a few thoughts. Um, thank you very much. There's beer and wine and. Maybe
made me some talk. And Robert Kaplan, thank you for coming back for decades and decades uh, to the Bali. Thank you for sharing your thought, uh, your incredible grasp of the whole globe. It's wonderful that you've been uh, thinking out loud on things which are happening so recently. Uh, uh, so it's no other way than thinking out loud, but that's very important, I think, in moments of this. So thank you very, very much, Robert Kaplan. Thank <laughs> you.